So we just computed a couple partial derivatives. Let's go ahead and compute one more. So we're going to find an x partial derivative. They're both a curly, uh, they're both deltas, yes. All right, so we're going to be taking what derivative? An x derivative. So without using any more brain cells, let's take an x derivative. All right, we take this x derivative. <clears throat> All right, there is two things we're going to watch out for. Uh, what is d? No. All right, we take an x derivative. We're treating y as constant. Trying to think of a good reason to explain why y can't be treated as constant here. All right, we'll just take the x derivative here and then we'll set certain ones equal to zero. So I'm gonna do an implicit derivative. So let's just focus on the yz part first. So when I take this derivative, I get dy dx times z plus dz dx times y. So that's the product rule from that first term right there. So any questions on this product rule before I keep going? All right, now I have a chain rule here. So it's minus, what's the derivative of ln of z? So it's gonna be one over z times the derivative of z times the x derivative of z. So we got the derivative of the natural log one over z times the derivative of z. So any questions on that chain rule part right there? So I want you to take the derivative of the right hand side. It should be relatively easy. There's no special rules to apply here. Now the x derivative of x you can write as dx over dx, but what can we reduce dx over dx to? One. So you're taking the x derivative of x, also known as one. You don't have to write it the way I wrote it. You can shortcut it right to one. All right, plus dy over dx. <clears throat> now I'm taking the partial derivative of x. So I want to find dz over dx, so I'm assuming I don't care about how, wait, that's not what I want to say. I don't care about how y changes with x. So I'm assuming that dy over dx is zero. I'm not going in the y direction. So now I'm gonna cross out all the terms that I am going to 
set to zero. So those terms right there I'm crossing out are I'm setting to zero. How do I solve for dz dx? You can say my favorite F word. Factor, very good. So we're going to factor dz over dx. And then divide. You have a fraction of fractions, you could get common denominator and reduce, but I'm just going to leave it uh, the way it's written here. So this is finding an implicit derivative. So let's look in higher dimensions. We had functions that had two inputs or three inputs. Let's look at n-dimensional inputs. So our function will go from Rn into R. How many partial, how many different partial derivatives would this function have? So this will have n partial derivatives. I could take one for each input uh, dimension. So we could write as fxk for k equals 1 through n. And of course that means d over dxk of f. So take the xk derivative. So in one dimension, in R1, differentiable implies continuous. So if our function had a derivative that was uh, defined, then you automatically got your function was continuous. So if your function was differentiable, you had to have uh, continuity. <clears throat> It'd be really nice to have that property in n dimensions. If your function has continuous uh, or it has is differentiable, it would also be continuous. So let's look at one example function here. So we'll take a function with two inputs. So this function is going to be sort of strange. It's going to either have the value 0 or 1. So it's 0 if x times y is not 0. So let's think about in the domain, when would x times y equal 0? If either x is 0 or y is 0 or both are 0. When does that happen? Along all the axes. Along all the axes, the x and the y axis. So our function has a value 1 above the x, y axis and has a value 0 not above the x, y axis. So our function will be 0 and 1. I'll just make the axes blue, one on the axis right here. So if your function is constantly zero, what would every derivative be? If 
function was already equal to zero, what would all your derivatives equal? Zero. zero. So everywhere off the axes, your derivative, your slope would be zero, both directions, because it's a flat function. So you're not going uphill, not going downhill. <clears throat> so not only is your function value zero, your slope is zero everywhere where it says zero. Now the question is, what happens as we get close to the origin? So something, we want to be very careful about what happens when we get close to the origin. We're going to approach the origin in two different ways. Uh, one way we'll approach is along the axis. Let's call that alpha 1 right there. Alpha 2, I'll switch over to orange. Alpha 2, I want to approach not on an axis. The easiest way is just go halfway in between the x, y axis. We'll just approach it that y equals x line. So if we're approaching alpha 1, the alpha 1 path, while we're going on the x-axis, the function value is always 1. So it's constant 1. What would our slope be approaching on the alpha 1 path if your function value is always 1? Your slope will always be 0. Now, if you think about alpha 2, we're going to have to get a little more creative to compute the slope when we hit the origin because it's going to jump from 0 to 1. So let's look at the uh, well, let's just look at partial derivatives. So actually ignore alpha 2. We'll just take alpha 2 Alpha 2 will be along the y-axis. So we look at partial derivatives at 0, 0. Fx of 0, 0, we said the, slope, the height was always 1, so our slope will be 0. That's the x derivative. The same thing happens with the y derivative. What happens if you're at the origin and you change y a little bit, your height will always be 1. So for a very similar reason, our height is 1 along the y-axis. So when you change at the origin, if you change your y-coordinate a little bit, your height's still going to be 1. So your slope will be 0. So we got both partial derivatives are 0 x direction and y direction. Is the function continuous? Think about how it's defined. It's either 0 or 1. Does it have a continuous jump between 0 and 1, or does it jump straight up? It just jumps up. So this function is not continuous. You can try to draw out what it would look like. Uh, let's see. I'll do my best. So <clears throat> it's going to have a value of 1 along the axes. So if I draw a perspective view, this is the xy plane right here. And then the x-axis and the y-axis will look like this. And it has a height 1 on here. So basically, the value is always 0, except it jumps up to 1 on the x-axis and the y-axis. So the function is not continuous because you go from being 0 and then all of a sudden jump up to 1. So that jump is not continuous right there. So we have a function that has partial derivatives that exist and are nice, nice number 0, but the function is not continuous at the origin. So we just found an example. So this function, uh, I should say, has a 
partial derivatives at 0, 0, but is not continuous at 0, 0. So the derivatives are OK, the partial derivatives are OK, but the function is not continuous. So what we're going to do is we're going to strengthen what does it mean to be differentiable. It's not enough for your partial derivatives to exist. Because what we want is differentiable implies continuous. So what we're going to do is strengthen differentiable so that if our function is differentiable, it has to be continuous. So we're going to modify differentiable. So before differentiable meant has a derivative at the point. Now it's going to be a little more complicated than has partial derivatives. So this is where we have the mixed derivative theorem. So if f, fx, fy, fxy, and fyx are defined and continuous, so they don't just have to exist, they have to be continuous as well. In an open set, around the point A. And what that means around a point A, that means there exists a disk centered at A with radius epsilon. So there's some small disk centered at A I need the word then. So then there exists a disk So what this says is the fxy is equal to fyx. Now I have not used this mixed partial derivative notation with you before, so let's break down what fxy actually means. So that's the end of the theorem. So what that means is take the x derivative and then the y derivative. So written like this, take the x derivative first and then the y derivative second, which we can write as d dx of f y and then d dy of d dx of f. So it's a little bit tricky. <clears throat> the way the order, it looks like the order reversed if I read the first one, it says x and then y, if I just go left to right. And then if I read on the other side, it goes y and then x. But if you think about which one actually acts first, it's always the one closer to f that acts first. So if you rethink in those terms, x, you take the x derivative first because it's next to f. And then you take the y derivative second because it's a little further away. The same thing is happening on the right side. Take the x derivative first, and then when you're done, take the y derivative because it's further from the f function. So any questions on the notation? It's a little bit funky because it looks like it reverses order, but it's always whatever's closer to the function f operates first.
So w is going to be xy plus e to the y divided by y squared plus 1. So first thing we're going to do is find w, x, y. And we find w, x, y. What we're going to first do is find w, x, and then take a y derivative. So first get the x derivative of w. What is the x derivative of the w function? So too much thinking. It's 1y plus, what's the x derivative of the second part of w? Why is it 0? It's complicated. Because all those y's are constant. So the whole thing is constant as far as x derivative is concerned. First derivative, the first term right there, derivative of x was 1, so you get 1y. So wx is just y. Now we're going to find the y derivative of wx. So we're applying the d dy of wx. So we're taking the y derivative of the y, which is 1. So now, part two, find w, uh, w, y, x. So find them in the other order. So find the y derivative first, which you do need to use some serious rules, quotient rule, and a little bit of chain rule, but mostly just quotient rule. So any y derivative questions? And the next thing we're going to do is take the x derivative of wy. What is the x derivative of this mess? 1, One plus 0. So that whole second term is all y's, so the x derivative zeroes that out. And we just get 1. So there's a definition of differentiable, which I'm going to skip because it uses some notation I don't want to go into, but there's a corollary that we actually use. So I'm going to jump right to the corollary. This is what you're going to use for the definition of differentiable. So if 
fx and fy. exist and are continuous in an open disk surrounding A then F is differentiable at A So we have a short version of this. Continuous first derivatives imply differentiable. Now we have the theorem when we use this definition for differentiable, now we can say that if you're differentiable at A, you have to be continuous at A. So we strengthen, you not just have to have partial derivatives, but your partial derivatives have to be continuous around the point. And then you can say that differentiable at A implies continuous at A.